No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today I'm in here with an up and coming YouTube sensation. Tommy G is in the building. Hello. How you doing, man? Life is good, man. How are you? Good. We just had a, uh, a workout this morning. It is currently 1.06. And at 8.30 this morning, Tommy was at my house and we were working out together. And I'm not going to lie. You were moving at a very fast pace and my trainer was kind of like rising to the pace that you were going at. And as a result, it was probably one of the most draining uh, workouts I've ever done. I've never been the guy that can go into a weight room and impress you with 15 plates <sighs> on each side of the squat rack, but I've always been a cardio machine. Really? Mm -hmm. Do you think that comes from the wrestling background and everything? That's how I would grind people out. Like everyone's tough for the first minute, you know, mm. but then when you get deeper and deeper and then they drown and you keep swimming, that's how the, the sharks <laughs> come wow. out. You know? I like that language. Mm. Uh, all right, so tell us where you're, where you're from. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right, and... Uh, Give us a little bit of a glimpse in your childhood. What was your upbringing like? I grew up in Crystal Lake, Illinois. It's the most white bread, suburban, Applebee's style America. I had mm -hmm. a very good supportive family. You know, if I wanted to go do wrestling, they would bring me to wrestling. If I do football, whatever it was. So I had a, a good childhood, supportive parents. I, I was a triplet. So I was the youngest and the dumbest of the three. You were actually the dumbest, oh, you yeah, by far. Why? They were like... Doing insanely well in school and everything? Oh, like, so we even had this one time, so my parents would take us out for good report cards. And so my brother and sister would come home with, like, a 4.2. They were in AP classes, all that. I would come home with a 3.4. And one time I found out that they waited till I went to a friend's house, and then they took Ben and Rose out, and I found out later. What, for, like, dinner or snacks or something? For dinner, and then they left me at the friend's house because I guess I wasn't cutting it. 3.4 wasn't enough? Compared to them, I guess not. I mean, what is your overall feeling on your parents, though? That sounds kind of cruel. I think it only happened once. I feel like every other time, I, I it was the same about a difference between them, and I still went. So because you know, I mean, as a triplet, because like I, I have a friend who's a triplet, mm -hmm. and I was hearing somebody else talk about him, and they said he grew up with like an insane sense of competition as a result, and I was like, that's very interesting. Would you say that's true? Yeah. So. And the thing is, we were always on top of each other. Like, even our lockers at school were next to each other. Driving to school were next to each other. We were in a lot of the same classes, so we were kind of in the, the smart program, but I was, like, the dumber, especially math and science. I was the dumber end of the smart spectrum. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, there was a lot of competition, um, but a lot of, like, really good times, too. A lot of, like, the family dinner table was a lot of fun because there was three kids that just went off in a lot of different directions, and we could talk about anything. Right. Wow, that's cool. Um, what, what did your parents do? So my pop, he passed away when I was a senior in high school. He was a salesman for IBM. Okay. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and entrepreneur. She made draperies and window treatments and custom pillows for people. And <laughs> so we had a little bit of entrepreneurial blood, but then also some of that sales too. Interesting. Okay. So how would you characterize yourself throughout high school and stuff? The single greatest influence in my life has been the sport of wrestling. That's what gave me all the struggle that I had. Because I, I didn't have a, a rough childhood. I mean, I was academically pushed and then... Uh, wrestling was a sport that really made me tough. Like to be, you know, when I was a junior in college, to be weighing, I was cutting to 157. And so it was such a yo yo, you know, like I'd be 170 on the weekend, cut to 157 by competition time every single week during the wrestling season. So, but looking uh, at that now, do you see that as being extremely unhealthy and dangerous? Mm hmm. Or I did, did it did more properly. Grasp? I mean, I didn't do anything stupid. Like I know guys that would go to Lifetime Fitness and sleep in a sauna, in a sauna suit. I mean, and then they were just dead. They couldn't ever compete. Wow. Um, I always try to just do extra workouts and then eat light. So, uh -huh. but now that I'm older, I wouldn't recommend. I would be like, you know, just eat healthy, work your ass off, but don't do anything too crazy because it's going to, you know, cut into your edge. And and so you started uh, wrestling at what age? 10. 10. And so you just loved it from day one. Like, how would you describe what you got from it? Hmm. Like the best things. I was the kid that loved practices but hate, hated competitions because I would get so nervous at competition. But practice, I just love being the dog. Like I love being the hardest worker in the room. And, you know, the coaches you know, do something crazy where it's like you're just bear crawling. You can see the furnace on the ceiling that's like blowing all the hot air in the room and kids are dying and some kids are breaking, some kids are staying strong. Like I just love the, the intensity of it and then also the confidence it gives you. Like, you know, I never look for fights. I haven't had a street fight in years, and I never want to have one mm. in my entire life. But, you know, I have a pretty good sense that if someone wants to fight me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'm going to be able to take them down and choke them out with my jujitsu. Does doing wrestling make you popular when you're in high school? Because I'm going to be honest, like, I felt like the people I knew 
wrestling was kind of a mystery yes. and i and i almost kind of regret that because <clears throat> now knowing so much about mma or knowing something about mma i realize what great training it is and everything and I, I i have a lot of respect for it but i was pretty oblivious to it in high school right well i think when we were coming up the mma wasn't popular and we didn't know that the wrestling was number one combat sport i mean if you look at all the ufc champions i think the last 52 ufc champions 26 of them were wrestlers right. 13 of them were jujitsu guys and then like a mixture of strikers were mixed in there so it got a lot of respect uh, from that but before i mean people would just thought oh like you're gay or you know it's that weird sport mm. like i don't want to be sweating whatever it was but i think um like a good quote i, I did a video a thousand dollar takedown challenge on miami beach and one of the guys i interviewed was like you know uh, i fought a wrestler once and i'm never doing it again and it's like you kind of have that like if i ever went to uh a bar or I went to jail or wherever and I saw a guy with cauliflower ear, I'm like, okay, this is the guy I'm probably going to team up with because he's probably... Oh, so you get that from wrestling a lot too? I thought it was mostly boxing. Uh, wrestling, rugby, boxing, but a lot of those sports, like just, if someone has messed up ears like that, like they probably know some stuff. Yeah, like I remember years ago being in the post office and there was like a 60-year-old black dude just standing in front of me and he had the worst cauliflower ear ever. And it was kind of crazy because I'm just like... Oh, so you were probably a really badass fighter at some point in your life. And yeah. Now you're an old guy, but you still got these fucked up ears. Yes. Which I actually just recently found out that there are like health issues related to the ears that it could fuck up your hearing. And there's a few bad things associated yeah, with it, right? I have a couple buddies from college that they have ears that they look like they could be in Lord of the Rings. Like they, <laughs> like you can't even put a headphone into the ear. It's that much of a, a slit. Wow. And so I'm sure like, you know, these are perfectly designed uh, Are your ears alright? Yeah, my I only have one ear that's a little bit. Oh yeah, it's like okay. But I also was I was a weird body type for a wrestler. Most of them are short, squat, mm. and really strong. I was more long and lean, so I think I was able to keep people at a distance and. Definitely. So were, were you always fascinated by social media? And actually, wait before we go down that road, when did you transfer to jujitsu, and how was that? Right after I got out of college, so I had all these big dreams, like my team national champion, per, or individual national champion, and we came close as a team. I think we, my freshman, sophomore year, and junior year, we pr placed uh, second, third, and fourth. So like we were a dynasty in the the D three wrestling world, and we were really tough. And then um, like my senior year of college, I beat the national champ twice. I majored, I beat the the fifth and sixth place guy pretty good. But for whatever reason in the national tournament, I just didn't wrestle the way I needed to. So I never all American. I, I made it to the blood round my junior senior year, where if you win, you all American. You lose, you go home. And um, and this is before like MMA really, right? So you're you're sort of like just, just doing as it's this coming up. Right, you're doing this mostly just out of passion. You're not really thinking this is going to turn into anything. Or oh. what? What were you picturing yourself doing later in life? I remember I was in college applying for jobs. Like I, I, I think I wanted to work for like Vice Media, or I just wanted to explore. Mm -hmm. And so my sophomore year summer, I got an opportunity to go live with a tribe in the jungle of Ecuador. So drink, spit, shoot blow guns, ayahuasca, the whole. Uh, Shebane. And so this was through the school or something. No, I just I oh, found just it on some website and I <laughs> emailed them myself and I chased it down. I love when a person who ends up becoming successful as a content creator, when you hear stories like that, you just realize like, oh, you were always a fucking crazy person. <laughs> yeah. Like you were going to do something <laughs> wild with your life. Wait, drink spit. So they have a, a drink called chicha and it's the most important thing in their culture. And so basically the women are responsible to make it and they they get river water, they get this kind of jungle potato and they chew it up in their mouth and they spit it into like a big uh, like canoe kind of a thing, like as a bowl. And then they get it and they put a, a big leaf across the middle of it and the bottom half ferments and you can get buzz off of it. The top half is just a calorie dense drink. And so like if these guys are going for a hunt, they'll just bring a little... Uh, like a little bag of chicha with them. That's all they need to survive for two, three days. They feel fine. Wow. That's crazy. So you were out there and you're how old doing ayahuasca? 19. <laughs> and mean... the ayahuasca never kicked in. I had a weird experience with the shaman really? medicine man guy. I was in his hut sitting on the floor and next to me was a woman with a baby and he was chanting and waving the leaf over her and trying to help her with some of the issues that the baby had. And the only advice he told me through my guy that I was with there um, hey, tell the white guy not to scream out when snakes start swirling in his vision. So I'm sitting on this wood uh, dirt floor just waiting for it to kick in, waiting to start throwing up, waiting for the most crazy adventure of my entire life, and it never quite kicked in. And when he asked me if I wanted a second shot, I'm like, this guy, he's just not making me feel very comfortable. Right. So if this, And this is an experience I want somebody to guide me through. Mm -hmm. So 
if it's meant to be, I'll try it again with someone that I feel a little bit better with. But that guy, definitely he, sounds one like a good video. Yelp review, you know what I mean? Yeah, it sounds like a good video though, for sure. I would love to go back and film that with those guys. Right? I feel like if you put "I did ayahuasca" in the YouTube title, that that might not work out so well. Yeah, I think YouTube might age restrict it, mm. strike you, and tell you to never do it again. So you'd have to choose a super corny title like "I got trippy in the woods." <laughs> you have or to <laughs> you know, Netflix executives, Hulu there executives, us. Um, we'd love to sell a few episodes to you. Hmm, very interesting. But uh, damn, so. You didn't walk away from that whole experience going to Ecuador as feeling like it was in any way like a scam or anything? Like, did it feel like it was actually like this very pure, important experience? Yeah, I've been really fascinated by people living in tribal situations because it feels like there's just such a great disconnect in how life is structured right now. And so being able to live in a village with 13 huts and a really strong community to me was something I really wanted to experience. Like I always thought like if I were to time travel, I'd want to go back to the Navajos or the Apaches or some sort of more peaceful tribal element and see what that was like. Mm. And so I think I just wanted to see what that lifestyle could be. Did it change your outlook on what you were doing with your life at that point? I would say it made me grateful for the little luxuries mm. that we have. And like some people just work so hard, especially, especially the women in that village, dude, like, at the crack of dawn, they'd be up making the fire. They'd be getting everything ready. Like if we were canoeing through, it, it was flooding at that time. It actually almost flooded so much that I couldn't leave because there's a plane that comes once a week into this kind of football field uh, landing strip. And it was raining so much that everything was flooding. And we were almost going into the flooding season where I could have been stranded there for a while. And so like we'd be going in the canoes through the trees and like spiders would be climbing up the tree and just clinging for life. And if the boat got stuck, the woman jumped off and navigated it. And so it just was, I just was blown away by how hard people work. But also these people had the option to go, you know, into the city if they wanted to, but they preferred this heavily. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. That is pretty amazing. So, okay, where, where do you go from there? So I finished my years in college and then I got a sales job for a corporate company. I was doing small business payroll. So uh, I, and so when I got into this office, they basically assigned me the hoodiest of the hood. Like one of the zip codes I was working is 53206, which is known as the most incarcerated zip code in the country. Six out of 10 dudes walking around have been to prison. And so I'm a kid that I grew up in a super white bread area. And then, but I'm a guy that's comfortable going anywhere. Like throw me into the jungle, throw me to the hood, throw me to whatever village. I'll go there and I'll, I'll make my way happen. Yeah, what, what is that about you? Like that's what I was thinking when you were telling the Ecuador story and then contrasting that with like going to the trap house in Chicago. is like you clearly have a pretty high risk tolerance, which I can relate to because we've done all these vlogs going to the hood and stuff. And it never – it never really freaks me out that much because I just kind of assume that people are good people. Right. That like, why would anyone want to shoot me? And people want to tell their story. Exactly. And and people tend to respect when you know if they invite you into their community, they take it upon themselves to protect you. So it's it's important that you meet up with the right people because you don't want to meet up with somebody who's getting bullied and picked on and shit. Because then you're probably gonna be getting bullied and picked on. But if you know or have a degree of confidence that the people that you're linking up with are on the up and up, it it, it doesn't really seem that like riding bmx all those years going to crazy ass neighborhoods in new york i kind of like developed that like confidence that people were mostly good and weren't going to take my bike yeah i think what the ability i have what what it is is that i'm in, intensely curious about people and so i want to hear what you have to say and so um, i think that makes you a welcome audience wherever you go and i think that you know if people see that you genuinely genuinely want to understand them or kind of get their point of view I think you're welcome in a lot of places. Right. So what were your experiences like doing that uh, that job in that area? Well, I learned a lot. Um, I would say like different stories pop up. Like I had a, a boss who was very by the book. Like he always wanted you to be in a suit and a tie. And I'm like, Dave, I'm showing up to these spots. People think I'm the FBI. <laughs> right. Can I please like let's let's change this up a little bit because it's getting a little bit frightening. You Throw know? a little polo shirt on or something. Yeah, just a little, a little lower. A, little a suit down. in a like a certain urban areas is just yeah, it's like a it's like a microaggression. Like, <laughs> you're really making it clear that you're not from here. I'm know? either a, an agency investigating your childcare business or I'm a like it's not a welcome visit probably yeah. if I'm showing up in a suit. Yeah, you know. So um, I think what I learned too is just if you can help people. And if you can make their life just a little bit better, like if I can make this aspect of your business easier by going through me, uh, people want to work with you. And then also not to be deterred, like 
probably half the appointments I would schedule would get, I would get stood up. I'd be going to their own business where they're supposed to be. And they, oh, I forgot. Can we do it tomorrow? Go back there. I forgot again. And it was just like, how do you guys get anything done sometimes, you know? And so like getting stood up a lot was definitely uh, frustrating. But I think overall, like it was this, it was one of those experiences that I thought was a total waste of time when I was there. Like I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. I feel like I'm meant for something a little bit more in life. But if I hadn't had that experience, this transition so good into what I'm doing now that I can go anywhere and feel mm. comfortable. And so like, it's interesting how your, your journey does align, even though you can't sometimes see it until you're looking back a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Like somehow the, the, the skills that like, and a lot of people when No Jumper came out, were like, how, like, how do you know how to do all this shit? Like, how did you, how does this seem so easy to you so quickly? And I was like, bro, I was doing this in the BMX world for 10 years where I basically had like training on how to run a media company. So once I got the ball rolling with the more music or underground culture side of things, it was just like a very easy transition. And yeah, like you don't realize it when it's happening, but you're, you're having these experiences all through your, your life that are basically training for something that you don't necessarily even know is to come. And I think it's really important to not take what you view as a stepping stone for granted because there might be skills you learn from that chapter of your life that are immensely important moving forward. And if you just kind of screw off and don't care about it, you're going to miss, like you're there, you have to be there anyways. You might as well apply yourself somewhat so that you can bounce onto the next thing. It's weird though because you always want to enjoy your life while you're living it, Mm -hmm. even though you kind of also simultaneously know that you need to struggle and you need to put yourself in an unenjoyable situations in order to grow a hundred percent i think the things that make you nervous are sometimes the things that you should most be doing yeah because once you knock on that door and you're brave enough to open it the things that are on the other side are sometimes the most remarkable things in life that we ever can encounter definitely and that's what keeps me going back to the gym it's just that feeling of like this is i'm not good at this i need to get better at this you know like this hurts like i want to fucking achieve something better and in order to do it i just keep having to fucking do this shit over and over and over yeah to me the gym is my church my jujitsu gym is my church really that's where i have my community that's where every time i leave that parking lot i'm like ah, i feel good man I is feel it good for me the thing i loved about jujitsu was just the pure full body feeling of being like devastated physically like I've, I've never had a workout that was quite like that where every single muscle in my legs and my arms was just completely lit up like unable to do anything when i got out of college i'm like you know what am i just gonna lift dumbbells for the rest of my life like what am i gonna do to stay in shape like to go from wanting to be a national champion to just like i'm gonna try and do something aesthetic it's just it didn't have the same pull and also you leave a huge brotherhood behind mm. and so i wanted to find that Again, and so I did one cage fight out of college. Uh, I did a little bit of striking. I did a lot of grappling. And um, to me, it was just like finding something that it's every practice is a new chess match. Like I've, if I go against you, I have no idea what you're going to start with. And then it's a puzzle that just keeps evolving. So it's a lot of fun and I'm never bored of a workout. Right. What belt are you? I'm a purple belt. Okay. My boy Danny Mullen is too, so you guys match up perfectly. That would be a great match. A long time ago, I believe I called him out for like $1,000 <laughs> to do a, a grappling match, but um, I was a more contentious man at that time. Uh, yeah, you were cloud chasing? I think <laughs> I wasn't breaking through on the prank videos. Right. And I saw a guy that I thought, you know what? I think I could take him. Yeah. I'm sure I could take him. Ooh. Let's put out an offer because... Sometimes you got to be bold to break through, right? Mm. So if I can put out an offer that, hey, this guy said no to this, but... I think he'd be open to it. I don't think so. Really? Well... We had this dude, Jason Ellis, on here. He's like a comedian and shit, and he's like a, a blue belt. Mm. <laughs> Danny just straight up told him, like, I outrank you. I will defeat you. <laughs> like, he seems so confident. <laughs> Danny Mullen. Uh, I'm in an interesting place here. I have a, fr- a really good friend that... They had a, a, a incredible beef, and uh, I don't really, oh. I don't inherit the beef. Okay, but I want to say, um, regardless of who it is, if it's a competition, I'm going to bet on myself. Okay, I like it. But um, and how long have you been doing jujitsu? I've been doing jujitsu for about five years now. And you go how many times per week on average? Four, five, six times a week. Wow. So like multiple times a day sometimes. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. Oh, and how long is the average class? A couple hour. hours. Uh, just an hour. Yeah. Okay interesting okay so you're you're working this job in the hood and not really enjoying it when do you start 
doing the social media thing or are you, are you watching a lot of stuff on, on YouTube and stuff at this time? I was actively making prank videos and I'm shocked that I never got fired. Like it was a miracle. I was always waiting for the call. Like HR is like, okay, you know, we saw this, you're out of here. Cause I had gotten arrested while I was working for this button up company. I did a, a prank where I had a fake ball sack. And, um, I think the bit was, uh, I pretended to be, I dressed up in like a nurse outfit. So I was pretending I was to be a doctor and I had the ball sack and I had like, I ran into a restaurant, I'm like, or no, a, a grocery store. I'm like, we're, we need to put it on ice. We need to put this on ice. Someone just lost their ball sack. And so like people were scrambling. It was a little bit much <laughs> now that I'm looking back at it. It was a little bit much. <laughs> that is so funny. That's still on YouTube. I think I have a lot of my prank videos on private. Okay. Because as I turn this new chapter in a documentary, somebody lost their ball sack. We got to put this on <laughs> ice. Is so funny, and the fact that people took it serious. Oh, there. I think that's the other thing. I think an ambulance might have been called. So like, <laughs> it's one of those things that like went a little farther than maybe it should have, and then somehow I the, need an unlisted link. Somebody yes. send me this shit. That's amazing. And in the midst of that, an old couple saw me and. They thought I was exposing myself because I think I had it jeans on and I zipped it up into my jeans and like in between <sighs> takes just to be funny. You know? Right. So. Holy shit. So you got arrested mm -hmm. and they let you out quickly, I'm assuming? or Yeah, I got processed, got my picture taken. They chose the ugliest photo that they <laughs> took of the lineup because I thought it was going to be so cool and make a T-shirt out of it. And then I looked like I was missing a few brain cells, you know, right. so it so, wasn't the triumphant, you know. But you felt like you didn't really have any real successes doing the prank stuff because I, I do notice that the prank thing, even after all these years, is such a reliable niche for like new content creators like somebody like Gideon, you know, he's got a ton of talent and personality. He could really be doing anything, but like doing pranks is basically like going up to people and fucking with them in public people you don't know and that is just such a consistent reliable thing what do you feel like you struggled mm. with in that regard i was always trying to make sense of that because i thought the stuff i was doing was so crazy and so bold that how could it not have broken through mm. and we had a little bit of success like we had uh the hella sus bars in the hood that that series took off a little bit and i had a couple other videos that had did, did well but i think the pranksters that are really popping off a lot of them I don't want to say they antagonize, but I was I always was doing stuff that was silly enough that I think like 95% of the people involved in it, like mm. even the people I was pranking, they weren't mad at me afterwards. Okay. Where I feel like the audience today, they want to see like, she got mad, Karen got mad. Like that's the mm. title. And to me, it's like, there's an old lady buying groceries. Like I'm not going <laughs> to antagonize her to the point where she has a freak out and then yeah. be like, make it, you know, that just I, didn't seem, it didn't, wasn't my personality. And I feel like there's more of a conversation about that nowadays where it's like, they're, you know, people who do that consistently for content, I feel like there's a lot more of a conversation about the fact that that is kind of fucked up. Well, I feel like to be a creator, you have to have some element to it that is innovative. No one's doing this before, but to simply be obnoxious is not really a skill set in my book. Yeah, but it definitely can make you go viral. And don't get me wrong. There's kids out there that are doing it right, that are making it happen, and kudos to them. And for whatever reason, I never broke through. Mm. And so... When I made this, the switch to documentaries, I was really counting down my time on YouTube. I thought, you know what? So I got fired. I had another corporate job. I got fired from it uh, a year ago on February 7th. So you didn't get fired from the uh, sales job? No. You just quit and moved on to another job? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was there about five years. A decent amount of the people in the office knew, and it was kind of like they, they thought I was funny too, so I was okay. And then I went to even more of a buttoned up sales role where I was supposed to be calling on the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and pitching on, on different stuff. And so um, they could tell my heart wasn't in it. They let me go on February 7th, 2022. And it was one of the best days of my life because basically when I, I went, I was, I was starting to do a little bit of real estate on the side. So I had a little pocket of money that was coming in. So I wasn't just, you know, destitute and desperate right away. And I told my wife, I'm like, look, give me six months. If I'm not making X by month six, I'll go back and I'll get another job. And then I think month four or five, the Kia Boy video took off and then everything changed and this became the clear path. Wow. So what were those first few months like though? Like how hard were you working? How much stuff were you releasing? And, and did you feel like you had any kind of traction at that time? Uh, so I, I have this list that was uh, ideas that can change my life. And so I had, you know, the Kia Boy video. I had jumping out of a plane while eating the world's spiciest chip. I had a few different things that I was executing on. And some of them totally whiffed, you know, running a marathon without training. And it was just like, oh man, like I'm getting 10,000 views, 20,000 views that is not going to pay any bills. And so um, 
Especially something like running a marathon with no training. Oh. That didn't do views. Like that sounds that, brutal. That was one of my lowest performing videos ever. And so I was so close to throwing in the towel. I'm like, wow. I don't know, dude, for whatever reason, the universe, like I'm not the guy. Like, and I, it was just such, like, it was such a down feeling. Cause I'm like, you know, there's no way I can go back and get another job. But I was actually working more hours in that period than I ever did having a job. And even right now I'm working way more hours than I ever did having a job. And so when I'm home in Milwaukee, it's editing, it's walking properties, it's watch, you know, watching renovations, it's making things happen. And then we come about, you know, once a month, five, six days, and we just grind, grind, grind. We maybe we're in this trip, we're getting uh, five videos done in five days, five podcast interviews done. And then I'm on your show. So we're just trying to keep the pedal to the metal and really take off. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. Your wife, was she, act, like, yeah, it's got to be a hard conversation. Like, I'm yeah. not really trying to have a job. I'm trying to make prank videos. Or at that point, it was kind of going a little bit beyond pranks or you were trying to experiment with different directions. Yeah. Yeah. And she wasn't as keen on the prank videos. Like, she encouraged me because it was something I wanted to do, but it wasn't something she tuned into and was like, that was fantastic. Like, I'm so glad you did that. I feel like prank videos are guy stuff. Yes. Yeah. So she definitely likes the the transition, but that's what makes her so special. I mean, we weren't married yet at that time. We were getting married. I got fired in February. We were getting married in October. And she was looking at a husband that didn't have a really good, strong mm. income. And instead of panicking or telling me, like, go get the job, she let me chase things. Mm. And it was such a strong contrast from the, the last relationship I had where I remember a car ride that just killed me where she was asking me, like, when are you going to quit making music? When are you going to quit doing YouTube and kind of grow up? And mm. then like to know that on the other side of that, like that belief with, with my wife is like, wow. And like, now we're going to have a, a fantastic life. Like we're going to set ourselves up and we're going to do very well. And we're going to be able to enjoy a life doing things that we love, which is way more important than the money is. It's just getting to wake up. And I don't care if I put a 14 or 15 hour day in like, I love my day. I get to do all the different things that I'm passionate about and excited about. And that is worth more than anything to me. Yeah, definitely. I think about that all the time. How even when I'm somewhat like devastated after like being on camera for eight hours in a day, I'm like, man, you know, I could have been doing something that I really didn't give a fuck about all day. You know, even when it feels draining in here, it's like you got to compare it to a normal day at work doing something that you don't want to do at all. And that's, really tends to put things in perspective yeah yeah i feel for people that have a dream and don't feel like they have the avenue because sometimes you're like you're in a position in life you're just like i know where i want to get but i don't really see the connecting point between the two and i've been there where i'm steering at the steering wheel staring at the steering wheel in a parking lot like listening to a podcast in the background just being like what am i doing <laughs> like how am i gonna get out of this and be able to be more free yeah Definitely. So what led you to the Kia boys? So I did this video um, first time going to a strip club. So I was able to document that experience. And again, shout out to my wife because she's a wonderful lady. Another tough video to get by on YouTube. Yes. Heavily edited. <laughs> um, although it didn't get as grungy as you could expect. Right. But basically, I found a, uh, a raunchy club in Milwaukee that was, uh, you know, a, probably half the patrons there were packing. You know, mm. it's one of those nice locations. And so I was able to document that. And then in the parking lot, I talked to a gentleman and we hit it off well. And he DM me. He's like, yo, I want to collaborate with you again. Let's, let's do something. I sent him four ideas I was working on. One of them was the Kia boys. He said, hold up, calls me back on FaceTime two minutes later. And there's a kid swerving in front of the block. And I'm like, let's line up next Tuesday. Let's fucking do this. Wow. So, but where did you hear about the Kia boys thing? That was just something you were hearing about? Oh, there are, I mean, they're notorious in Milwaukee because they're kind of terrorizing the city. I mean, if you rent a Kia, if you have a Kia, it's so likely it's getting stolen. Right. And like the, the police stations were giving out, uh, the, the, the clubs that go over the steering wheel for free. It was just a known thing that these kids are wild. Like you see them driving and parks where kids are playing you see them driving on the sidewalk of a high school where people are walking into the class you see what? them crashing out like they they have a particular driving style where it's like and there's a music that accompanies it the milwaukee low-end scene and basically like these kids just swerve as much as they can in the car and i actually an ex-girlfriend i had she got her car stolen she she left it running and she was just a, a nice innocent midwestern girl that didn't think her car would get stolen she left it running and it got taken and it's not like they take it and use it for as many days as they possibly can. 
they took it. They stole her purse. They went to go try and buy blunt wraps at three different gas stations. We were really kind of triangulate them. And then they crashed it and just go on to the next one. So it's not like profit. It's just kind of after school activities. Is there some something kids. about Kias that they're easier to steal or? Yes. They're by it's like far, the cheapest car, right? Like, they're, they're, they're leveling up their brand a are little they? bit. I thought it was a pretty cheap car. Okay. I mean, but I know that it is the easiest to exploit. Mm. There's a reason there's not Chevy boys. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they are probably stealing a lot of other cars as well, too, right? Yeah. Hondas are also a popular one. And anything they can really get their hands on. But, like, a Kia is something that you can pull up. And if you know the methods and there's no one there to bother you and stop you, you can, you know, a certain brand and make, you can reliably get away with. Right. So what was the feeling like before you went and met up with these guys? Like, I, I mean, having probably not spent that much time around, you know, flagrant criminals. <laughs> it might have been kind of weird, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing I've learned over the years of do or the, the last actually eight months of doing these videos is like I've met with pimps, I've met with guys that sell fentanyl, I've met with Kia boys, I've met with homeless guys that live under Las Vegas. And the line between good and evil is a lot different than I would have expected. Cause you think like some of these people, they must be such big pieces of shit. Like this is gonna be a terrible experience interacting with them. And then you realize like, oh, that's just a kid. Like a kid that could easily play be playing chess or basketball instead of stealing cars or that's a guy selling heroin, but if you if I didn't tell you that and I invite him to a dinner, he'd be a pleasant guest to be around. So it's kind of uh, been interesting to discover that. Yeah, definitely. Like I mean, in particular with the Kia boys, it's kind of like, I mean, it, you can't look down on them because, or you can't look down on them fundamentally, right? Because they're products of their environment. They were brought up in a fucking culture that normalized this type of shit. They don't feel like they probably have any fucking opportunities or whatever. It's kind of like, I, I just look at them as basically like just nihilistic teens who don't see a future them, for themselves and don't really like know a way out of their predicament. I definitely agree with the nihilistic part. Like these are kids, they don't care if they die. They don't care if you die. They don't care if they're stealing a single mom's car, mm. but you can never give people a pass. I mean, that is some people's only route to keeping a house, a roof over their head is their car that gets them to work. And so to take that away, if they don't have insurance, I mean, some people go homeless because of this. Yeah. And so while I feel for kids and I can't imagine growing up in a really difficult environment and seeing bloodshed at a 11 years old, 12 years old, that really hardens your heart and mm. changes your perspective of the world, you still you have to hold people accountable. I mean, anyone you love, you hold accountable. Like if your girlfriend, you, you'd hold your girlfriend accountable, your mom accountable, your friends accountable. You got to hold people accountable. So you can't just let people freely steal your shit. But in that situation, when you're on camera with them, it's not exactly a situation where you're probably, where, where you feel comfortable giving them your full opinion on the long-term effects of their behavior and everything, right? And especially for a YouTube video, it's like, you kind of want to keep the vibe light and, and fun to it. For sure. And right? that I got my first interaction with mainstream media when that it was getting picked up all over the place. And like one lady kind of ambushed me. She's like, you know, pretending like it was going to be a good phone converse or a good interview. And then she's like, she starts off like, you were laughing in the video with these guys. Like, what do you have to say to the victims of the families that have died from this? And it's like, you go to this corner and hang out with these kids. One, they are just normal high school kids like the, the kid had some really funny lines like there's a lot of lovable aspects of these kids and on the same end they're stealing your shit so it's like uh you go to the 15 year old that's toting a pipe and wave your finger at him and see how it goes like there's a reason the mainstream media doesn't get any of these scoops because the one they're too scared two you can't show up with a suit 15 cameras and just the voice they talk and when they're reading the the news it just is none of it is real so, but also like the local news, I think would consider it unethical to go and hang out with a like. I'm thinking about the St. Louis video, mm -hmm. the murder capital or whatever video yeah. that I watched last night, where you're on the corner with probably 20 dudes and they all have like numerous firearms, just out on the street. They don't give a fuck, mm -hmm. and it was pretty unbelievable. I feel like the news knows that's going on, probably could get access to that, but they would consider it kind of unethical to be glamorizing it or documenting it in such a way like do, do you wrestle with that at all yeah one of the guys uh that interviewed me said you know i actually really liked the documentary i think it was fantastic that you got their perspective but what i didn't like is i showed a clip of them showing how to steal the cars and he said that was really unethical and i i didn't really think much about it at the time but now you know i want to be more aware of 
what I'm putting out, but I think at the same time, like I'm trying to get access to people and stories that almost no one gets access to or, or is too scared to go to or doesn't want to take the time to wander in to some of these places. And I really am curious to hear their motivations for some of the things they're doing. But it's kind of interesting because like Vice will send journalists to Mexico and have them embed with the cartel. And, yeah. you know, but then that's that's treated as kind of different. You can show off all the cool cartel weapons and show what their their drug supply looks like. Mm -hmm. But it's different because it's a different country. It's not like just some kids hanging out, stealing cars down the street. I don't know. It's yeah, I think, you know, we have a really real... Like, I've been having a lot of trouble getting people that are more buttoned up to appear on camera with me. Mm -hmm. Like anyone that is more proper sees some of my content and stays clear of what I do. Even though if you look at my channel, like I've done graveyard ceremonies with witches. I've hung out, hung out with a hundred million dollar man. I've gone to the underground tunnels of Las Vegas. Like I think I have some of the most diverse documentaries on YouTube. And so um, you're yeah. running into the same problem that me and everybody else runs into, which is that your most salacious or most violent or most ridiculous content ends up being the stuff that goes viral. Like I see people say, oh, well, TMZ, you know, if they I, I would be OK with them reporting on Kobe Bryant's death first if they were also putting out positive stories. I'm like, if, have you ever looked at the TMZ homepage? Like they post all kinds of shit. You just don't give a fuck unless it's the thing that goes super viral, you know, to me. I'm always going to chase the raw shit I can. And so if I get to go to a doctor and do a ketamine experience with a guy that has a, you know, MD next to his name, perfect, I'll do it. If I get the you did invite, that? I, I, I was, a, I was setting idea. it up, but then, and he said yes, and then he saw more of my channel and then he canceled. <laughs> so, so, and I'm, I'm down to talk to anybody. Like there was a LAPD detective that was supposed to meet with me. He agreed and then backed out once he saw more of my channel. Really? And so... I don't know. I, I get it, but people are too... You hanging out with somebody does not mean that you're them. Right. We should be able to have a conversation with anybody, and that's the thing that's really hurting us in this political climate, how we're interacting with each other as people, is you should be able to sit down at a table with anybody, and if you don't agree with them, that's part of the game. Like The fact that you can only sit down with people that check all the boxes that you believe in, like that's not even interesting because I already know everything you're going to say. It doesn't like, so what's the point of even watching? But now it feels like everybody from, I don't know if you've seen this YouTube channel, Jubilee to Vice is doing it all the time. Now we've done it a little bit, like the whole concept of like getting people with polar opposite mm. opinions and then getting them on camera. Even like a lot of the Twitch commentary space, they do this where you'll have mega progressive people having people who are like basically white nationalist yeah. type dudes on their show. And it's like, that was for a long time kind of looked down upon like oh you're not supposed to have conversations with these people because you're boosting their message but now i think people have realized like the need for conflict in videos and in content is just so strong that they're they're willing to do whatever yeah and plus i think when you really sit down with people you realize like you could put most people in this country together and i bet there's like 70 percent of stuff that we could agree on that that's what should be the platforms for politics but instead we want to make these two opposite camps and you can only you can't even be in the middle a little bit or your, you know, moderates aren't, aren't really welcome. So I definitely agree. Like we need to be able to sit with people and I don't like, yeah, you might sell fentanyl and I might watch a guy inject in your trap house in front of me, but I'm still going to treat you like a person and build a relationship with you. You know, I mean, you seem like a pretty optimistic, positive person, but when you plunge yourself mm. into something as depressing as like i was watching you go to zombie land or whatever yeah. uh, the home of the zombies and it was just like fentanyl overdoses taking place everywhere all over the streets like, it's like it's nothing there's just dudes walking around administering narcan and they're saying that this is happening like a dozen times a day like yeah. nothing i i lived like downtown right near skid row for for a few years it's a wild place yeah and it's like you know over time it gives you a lot of time to think about like, well, what the fuck is the solution for this? And for me, it's like, I, I never came up with anything even close to an answer. And when you, if you try to like Google, how do we fix homelessness? You're going to read a bunch of big ideas, but you're also going to read a lot of people feeling pretty like helpless to ever make it happen. Like, how, how do you deal with that? Like when, when you're watching these people overdose in front of your eyes and, and it's tough to come up with a solution. That's that's definitely something that me and my crew spend a lot of time thinking about, and a lot of my, well, my friends like that's some of our conversations is like, okay, like this was the situation in Las Vegas with the homelessness. Like, what would we do if we were mayor? This is the situation with those kids in in St. Louis. What would we do to help their life be a little bit better? And 
I don't know. I think what America should be is the land of experiments. So if you want to have, you know, radical AOC try something out in New York, and then you want to have radical on the other side, Ron DeSantis try something in Florida. Let's let's have a battle of ideas. If he has one way with dealing with homelessness, she has another one. Let's observe and see what happens. And if someone is winning the battle of ideas, then let's replicate it across other cities and let's spread that way. I feel like those motherfuckers do not be talking about homelessness. I think <laughs> Maybe they they're too sometimes. busy getting some of their lobbying pockets lined mm. and keeping the military industrial complex running to, I think, spend much time on homelessness. Mm. Try some, some truth to that. So, okay, what are your, what were the craziest experiences that you've had doing this? You told me about the Mexican uh, car, cartel video Police, that you did. Yes. Or, or the, the cops ran in the building. So we were, we were doing a story on immigration. We were in Eagle Pass, Texas, and crossing over to Piedras Negras, Mexico. And so we were interviewing a rapper named Hostage, and we just wanted to get his story. He was previously, he was born in Houston. He did a few felonies. He got deported, came back, got did some crimes, got deported again. Mm. And we were just talking to him. And then uh, 10 minutes into the interview, we get raided. Three policemen, mask, assault rifle, come in. We go hands on our, you know, heads down on our knees. The Mexican guys were straight on the floor. Like they weren't even, but I was so stunned that it was like, I didn't even know what to do at first. Like, is this a prank? Is this cartel? Is this police? I had no idea what it really was. And so um, that was probably the scariest moment of my life. And just like, I've never felt so helpless. Whatever they wanted to do, it was up to them. Like if they were going to, I always think in my head that if, if, I, if I ever came to like, they were trying to, if someone was trying to abduct me. Like I'd rather fight it out in the street. And if I get shot and die there, it's going to be way better than whatever like warehouse I get taken to and duct taped to a chair, like die at least trying to fight. But there was no like hero in me at that moment. It was all just like, okay, uh, I hope these guys uh, just let us go and let us get out of here because. And were you filming at the moment that they burst in? Yeah. So we, so Miguel put the camera on the ground and so we, he, he has them bursting in and then he had it while we were flat on the floor, like movement of their boots and they come in a frame but they deleted those two images. So they made wow. us get the camera. He put headphones in, but the thing is he didn't speak any English. So we're lucky he didn't because some of the stuff Hostage was saying, he could have gotten the shit kicked out of him if that guy knew what he was saying. Really? So, um, but they looked through the footage, they deleted it. And then I'm like, um, but officers, like I, I speak decent Spanish. So I was just trying to be, uh, let them know like, hey, we're just trying to get a story here. Can we, can we interview you now? But they were having none of that. <sighs> and they told us, send a copy of the video before you post it. And then they also said, if you want to come back, we can take you on a day in the life of the police. We didn't send them a copy because... Yeah, what are the odds they're going to find out about it anyway? Yeah, and we thought about, like, would we be burning a bridge if we wanted to go back and film with them? But also, dude, it was just so scary. I don't, And I think they were actually honestly good men. And that, that's not something you can say about all of the Mexican police. There's definitely some really shady... Really? Ga oh, there's, some of those guys are scared more of the police than they are of the cartel. Well, that's what I was going to say is I almost feel like I would rather, I would feel more comfortable going to Mexico and doing a video with some gangsters than some some cops because I've just heard infinite stories about how gnarly the cops are out there. I think it's like what, the, what Hostage said is it's no man's land. So there's, there's plenty of guys that are from the borders of Texas that they go to a nightclub in Mexico on their way back to their car. It's like, uh you know, here's a little tax. Give me some of your shit. Mm. Sometimes you give everything you have except for what you need to cross back over the border. So the fact that, like, I feel like Mexico could be one of the best places on earth. They mm. have beautiful people. They have beautiful land. They have so many natural resources. Uh, everything is so cool. But then they have such a big issue with how power is distributed. Like, mm. it is a very frightening place to be if you're in the wrong spot. It's crazy that it's right there. And that they just deal with problems on such a scale that we really don't. Like when you look at how gangs move, like violent drug moving gangs, it's just like it's not even close to the level that they have to endure. I've recently been reading a lot of books about the cartel to just because it's been such a fascinating thing to want to dive into. And like El Chapo, when he was on the run, at any point he could have dozens of tunnels that were being built in different safe houses. And like if they have a car that has a gun and some other stuff, they might have it where you have to turn the turn signal on, hit this button, and then you can open. Like, they have some very sophisticated Even the way operations. he got out of prison? 
Yeah. He chiseled his way out and like hopped on a motorcycle. And and the fact they have so many connections, so many people <laughs> they can pay off along the way. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened. When you have a billion dollar crime empire and no one enforcing you, that's but what you, you do. You ever get pulled over in your car and you're just thinking in your head like, God, I wish I was in Mexico and I could just give this dude like a hundred bucks and he'd no, let me go. <laughs> I've never thought that because the chances of me getting my ass beat in America compared to Mexico, I feel like... I'm much more likely to get my ass beat in Mexico. Because I've never even, like, I've never bribed a cop. I've never even thought of it. I've always, like, seen it on TV and shit and just realized, like, oh, like, I'll get in more trouble if I try to bribe the cop than if I just accept whatever's happening. I would, what would you guess? 99% of cops in America, if you try and bribe them, would get you in more trouble? I I do feel like that, but I don't know why I feel like that. I don't know why I believe that the cops have good hearts out here. Actually, I also believe that many of them are wearing body cameras and that there's like... There's more accountability. (laughs) Yeah, but I don't know why. I just... Yeah, I actually... I'm not saying I love the the cops in the U.S., but I am assuming that the vast majority of them wouldn't take a bribe. In America, if you want to get out of shit, it's not about bribing the police. It's about playing the legal system with the lawyers the right way. Yeah. And so... Every system has a way to exploit it, and people certainly do every day in America. But I think when the police pull you over, slipping them a hundred is not going to go as far as it might in Mexico. No, but what if you have like ten grand? Maybe if he got <laughs> just got divorced, the mortgage is coming up. I mean, I think you have to catch a guy in the right time and yeah. right place. But otherwise, oh, that's another charge. Yeah, definitely. Damn. Um, okay, so how do you? avoid like how do you continue to do different stories when you kind of know that in a certain way if you cover the most salacious shit the most dangerous shit the most gnarliest hood shit that you're gonna probably get the most views from that but i feel like that also could like really impact like the way that your channel's viewed if you just get a little too deep into that stuff i see some like hood vlogging type channels that I don't know. Like they probably they, they have a weird image because they're just sort of like up in everybody's shit doing videos in the same old projects over and over, and it's it's kind of weird to imagine that lasting so long, too long. Not that I don't appreciate the work they do. My brand is this: I want you not to be able to predict what video is coming out next. So we just dropped a video of snake hunting in the Everglades. Before that, before that, we were at a furry convention. Before that, we were with uh, one of Kodak's Black's artists, Little Cricks. Mm. Before that, it was the takedown challenge on the beach, and so. I'm a guy, I never want to be put into a box. And maybe the the balance of it, because I do know, like, yeah, the right now, the content that blows up the most is the the drug dealers, the guns, the it's the crazy stuff. Uh, so I'll, I'll put out about one of those a month, sometimes twice a month, but I really uh, am fascinated in so many directions that I don't want to become one-dimensional. And I also want my contacts to open up. Like, if people only see, oh, you're going to go interview the guy that sells fentanyl, all my other leads dry up and there's too many things to be excited about and, and interested about to put myself in one lane. Interesting. What else would you say you're like really uh, interested in now? And are you always kind of regulating? You could be super interested in something, but then if you think that it sounds like a terrible YouTube video, you kind of have to consider that, right? Yeah. I mean, I think most of the ideas I have, um, I want to have it at a level that I think it would be entertaining for me, entertaining for, for people. But um, I'm always I'm always brainstorming. So like the way we I run the channel is we'll pick a location. We'll pick L.A. and I know that I want to get between four and six videos done in my five day stretch here. And so I just start digging into different contacts. I find different leads. Like the next one we're planning, we're looking to go to New York, go to the Diamond District, go to Jewish Holiday uh, Purim. Mm. Um, the Shah G, the the G's group, uh, like some that. of those different rappers. Use G's. He, he raps like he's a the singer of Cannibal Corpse. Yeah, the really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, no, that, I that, did it wrong. It's more like. Bruh, 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 bruh. So we're lining up. We're trying to line up those three pieces, and then you know maybe there's an underground tunnel. I know there's mole people in New York as well. So then it's like, if I get my three videos that I know, okay, no matter what happens on this trip, I'm gonna at least break even, if not be you know do very well. And then I can start branching off to the other ideas that might interest me. How consistent is the money and everything for you? Because I know your videos, especially when you're covering the hardcore stuff, I'm sure YouTube gives you a hard time from time to time, but you do a lot of blurring and editing, I notice. Yeah, I would say probably 30 to 40% of my uh, videos are demonetized, especially YouTube says I can't say demonetized when it's the yellow icon, but you know what you see, like, you know, you might get 500,000 views and you get paid like, 
15 bucks. It's like, you might as well just demonetize me because yeah. I don't need 15 bucks. You it's know? better so, than being age restricted where they can't even watch it without being logged in and everything like that. But it's still, it's for all intents and purposes, it's demonetized. And that is not even always the biggest problem because the biggest problem is just that when it gets demonetized, the, the graph will be like, yeah, like it just flattens the fuck out. So the, the big thing, like being an entrepreneur is you got to have your multiple streams. And so like some months, the ad revenue is really good. Other months I take, you know, I just take it in the pants and it's really bad. But, you know, then I might negotiate. I have a team that does sponsorships and I'm iffy about the whole sponsorship thing because it's I don't want to give people an ad. You know, mm -hmm. if I was making so much crazy money off just the YouTube and the Patreon and the merch, I wouldn't consider it, but I'm still building my empire. So to me, if I can make my commercials very entertaining, I like I actually work really hard at my commercials. It's I not just a, that, yeah. a read because I said, if you're at least going to take the time to watch through it, I want to make it worth your time. And that, so that's kind of how I justify it to the audience of like, okay, I'm going to do this. Definitely. Plus, if I'm going, like right now, I'm trying to also line up a trip to Brazil where we go to the favelas, we train with the uh, special forces, we visit a prison, we talk to BBL doctors. Like that's going to be just... A big, That's huge great. expense right crazy. off the gate. So it's like, I need the reserve so that if one month I get absolutely the dog shit beat out of me by YouTube, okay, I'm still good because I need to. I still need to go on a trip at least once a month, and I gotta pay for me, two other guys, sometimes my wife, sometimes a friend to join, and you know. So, so I want to make sure I'm structured right. Do you do all your own edit? You have editors, or you do your own editing? Miguel is the primary editor. I edit. So and then we have a guy named Jack as well. So basically. Like when I come home from LA, I might have five videos. And so Miguel will take two or three. I'll take one, maybe two. Jack will take one or two. We'll see how the rotation is going. Cause these are very time intensive yeah. videos. And so like re releasing on every Tuesday is kind of like being on a treadmill that's set at a very high pace. And this is where the, the wrestling connection comes back in is like, I take that same grinder, that dog mentality that I had in the wrestling room. And I bring it to how I do my business. Like I'm still going to, every Tuesday, I'm going to put something out that either you can't believe I went to this place or it's somewhere you never had access to, and but we balance the editing to get ahead of the curve for uploading. Because it might take six uploads for YouTube to approve it, mm. and that puts, you know, so... But do you get feedback after each time, or do you just keep editing a little bit and uploading? Sometimes it's tempting to just keep re-uploading until they finally decide that they're going to let it go. I try and take the timestamps that they find trouble with out, and so that way they can say not like, hey, I've done everything you've asked me. How can we keep running into this issue? The other day I was watching a workout vlogger and he said the word vinegar and he edited in the middle of it. And I was like, oh, he was really scared. huh? Well, because probably that was the timestamp there. It said like, oh, there's a racial slur in this video. And like I was like, this is cannot continue like this. <laughs> like if you are forced to edit out the word vinegar, we have a real, real problem here. I really think that I think the pendulum swinging back because I think we've gone through a period where people have been really scared to say things. And I think the pendulum swinging back, that as long as you're you're genuine, you're trying to tell you tell the truth, you have a good heart about you, you're allowed you should be allowed to make mistakes as a human. Like how much dumb shit have we said, especially the younger we were? Like I'm picturing like some of these people are really shaking the fingers at a Kia boy. And it's like, well, I know what I was doing when I was their age. I was sneaking out. Ding dong ditching, lighting off fireworks, lighting off Drano bombs, or you put the big two liter bottle, the tin foil, the the plumbing solution, you let it blow up, right? Yeah. We just put it in the middle of a retention pond because we just were anticipating the boom. And so, and, and I knew kids that were car hopping, I knew kids that were garage hopping and stealing from different places. That was where I drew the line was was theft, but I was willing to make a kaboom in the middle of the night. But I am not that much different than these kids. They are just taking it to the extreme and they're also coming from a much more extreme environment than I did. Mm. So you have to be able to look at people and see a little bit of yourself in them and then you understand, whoa, like there's hope for all of us and we can actually have a way forward. Do you ever feel like you're getting played in a way where like, maybe somebody is not being their real self when you go see them, especially since you're dealing with rappers sometimes. And a lot of rappers are very, Fronting. they're very good at marketing, you know, and they might be acting as if they live this different lifestyle than what their life is really like. Is that ever a concern? You know, I try and screen people decently well, like the mm -hmm. most contacts, especially the more dangerous the area, I'll try and have <laughs> three or four phone calls, a few FaceTimes and get a feel and just talk to them as a person. Like it's not all about the video. Like who are you as a person? And so like even the trapper in Chicago, 
I still FaceTime him and catch up with him and see how he's going. He seemed like a nice guy, yeah. He's a nice guy. <laughs> and he was asking me for tips about YouTube. Like, he thinks he might want to start, and I'm happy to... And meanwhile, there's literally junkies smoking heroin in the other room. Yes. Hey, it's for everybody. It's the duality of man, right? Yeah. We all got a little yin and yang. It was funny hearing you talk to that guy because he just he's just like, it's business. It's business. And I'm like... That makes sense to me, but I also feel like the the conversation deserves to go further than that. So I think to build on maybe where you're getting at is like, do I ever feel like I'm not a very confrontational person? I'm never going to have an interview where it's a gotcha interview, where I have all these like things that I'm going to try and spring you into a trap. Right. But I do think depending on their occupation or why I'm interviewing them, there's got to be enough tough questions that at least test their character a little bit or like, you know, from the outside looking in, this looks really like the pimp. Hey, from the outside looking in, this looks like it could be really messed up. Mm. What do you like? What do you think about yourself in the terms of right and wrong? But like, okay, interviewing a pimp who you ultimately decide is really like mostly behaving in a consensual manner and that the girls are there, their own free will or whatever. I could see how that would be pretty easy to justify in your head. But what about doing a video with a sex trafficker? Like something really abhorrent that you could never get behind. Would you? Would that be just like over the line? What if you had the opportunity to do a video with an assassin, or uh, Jeffrey Epstein, or you know? <laughs> yeah. I think, I think I would take the opportunity. And is is it possible that someone is a skilled enough sociopath? They're going to outsmart me and you know present an image that maybe isn't real. Of course, that's the that's the risk you're taking because it's not like I get to really build a relationship where I truly know. Like a lot of these situations, there's a little bit of nerves in the car. On the way there, like you're going to the trap house, it's like, like you're going to the host role where there's a bunch of pimps. Like you're going to the Kia boys. There is definitely a. Uh, but a all that, of, all that shit is kind of lighthearted compared to like you know some of the certainly. the stuff that you could do. Although even like you know with the, I mean like when you go do stuff with these gangsters in Mexico and stuff. I mean who knows what the fuck they're doing? They'll they'll show you a little bit of their drug trapping operation, but like who knows what the fuck else they're doing that they're not trying to share with you? You know. Right, definitely. Uh, and I also think, like, one thing that blew my mind about Mexico is, like, America has so much drugs, and the quantities, like, the different selection is so easy to get, and there's so much of it. I think these guys that were selling drugs in Mexico, I think they were very low-key, like, because you can get your ass kicked for having a gram on you in Mexico. If the police roll up on you and have a gram, like, that, they don't really smile upon that. So um, I think even though they're like, oh, yeah, like, we're kind of in this, like, I think they were still mostly what I've learned is I'm not getting the most El Chapo is not speaking with me. <laughs> right. And if something like that ever comes up, it would be very scary to say yes, but I think I, I would. I'd have to make sure that I'm not gonna get decapitated on camera if I go do something. But I haven't really broken into like I had some connections into Miami of guys that had pushed pushed serious cocaine weight. Mm. No one's even gonna consider going on camera that are like the real guys that are pulling millions. No one's gonna why? Why would they? Because I was even thinking that with the Chicago dude. Like, what is he gaining from this? He's he's completely hit his own identity. But you know, it's like if I'm a cop in Chicago, there's like there's only so many drug dealers, right? Like, I, I assume that in some way that could come back to get them, even if you blur their voice and they, you can't see their face. It's like the people on the streets probably know exactly who this is, right? That's the other thing that um, is a big part of the editing. Like, and this is why I get a lot of these contacts. Is I tell these guys like, look. I'm going to send you a copy of the video before I post. They send it back. Hey, blur this part and can you change my voice? Okay, do that. I send it back to them. Until I get their approval, I do not send it out. So that's one way that I build credibility with these guys. And then two, one, I don't want to send anybody up to get popped. Because to me, I mean, you know, this is, I, I'm in the next city the next day. So I have nothing to worry about. But I'm not trying to ruin someone's life over a 15-minute video. So I want to be very careful and like I would say this to these like the St. Louis kids when I pulled up, I'm like, guys, just to let you know, there is a camera filming. So anything you don't want on camera, it doesn't need to be out. Like I never ask people, hey, when I show up, have every single drug you've ever owned out, have all your guns out. But people just some guys want to flex and that's just how they do it. That's the crazy thing about that St. Louis shit is that they're allowed to have those guns out there, right? I think the laws there are a lot easier to have that type of weapon yeah estg when i interviewed him told me that in louisville kentucky that you, you go to his neighborhood it's like everybody's walking around with a big ass machine gun in their hand which yes. is terrifying I'm, I'm not sure that that's I, I i'm not sure i want gun safety laws to be that loose you know i interviewed a guy that um on the other side of the estg 
Uh, well, I guess they're, they're somewhat beefing, but that's something okay. that I never cover. Like, even if I know going into it, like these two are beefing, I'm not going to ask one single question about it because okay. I don't want to be the guy that sparks anything that can ruin a family or lose a life or someone get injured or they can't walk anymore because they got like i am not inter interested in any of that violence or, or in encouraging it in any way because to me i look at a lot of these guys and i'm like i see the talent that you have and i wish there was another outlet that you could explore because that like this violence is getting crazy yeah and it's like it's one thing to document drug dealers or people stealing cars and shit but then at a certain point yeah it's like where do you want to draw the line in terms of talking to them about beef when you know just take the chicago shit it's like once you really start to learn about the gds versus the bds you're talking about a situation with hundreds maybe thousands of dead people on both sides of it mostly young men kids died in it like women like innocent bystanders it's crazy it's hard to like look at it and just be like oh this is just some shit i'm listening to somebody rap about at a certain point yeah and so like another element of my brand that i think is really important to me is i'm never going to be the tmz guy that's like oh like Justin Bieber walking out of a funeral. Justin, your parents just died. How do you feel? Like, yeah. like that type of bullshit. Like, get out of here with that. I want to be the guy that really tries to get to know you as a human being. Mm. And I'm not. That doesn't mean I'm going to shy away from some of the tougher questions. Like, hey, you know, when you sell someone heroin and someone dies, like, where do you come into the play for that? Like, so I'm not going to necessarily leave someone off the hook, but I'm also not going to attack them or try and get them into a position that's going to jeopardize them. Definitely. How do you, or do you see a lot of people who kind of act like you're doing some culture vulture shit? Like even when I uh, said that I was doing this content with you in my group chat, there was like, most of the people fuck with you. It was like one person was like, I don't know about that dude, man. He's just be white boy going to the hood, yada, yada. Like, I, how do you take that criticism? First thing is, how do you think I get these connections? Mm -hmm. It's these guys are DMing me. So like, I don't have a network around the country of random people. Like I'll get a guy from Philadelphia will message me. A guy from Miami will message me and then I'll line it up. And then as far as the culture vulture thing goes, I mean, I don't think I'm pretending to be anything that I'm not. I'm not walking in here acting like I'm some big dog, some big gangster. I know exactly who I am. I'm a kind of nerdy, weird white guy who likes to wrestle and do jujitsu and read books and go walk in the woods. So I'm not fronting on anything. And the other thing is like, I think the whole cultural appropriation thing, I see both sides of it, but the stance I kind of see is like, okay, does that mean if you're not German, do you not get to eat bratwurst? If you're not a Greek, do you not get to run a marathon? Like, where do we want to draw the line? And the reason people come to America is because we have so many interesting flavors going together. I can walk down the street, I can eat Afghani, I can eat Jamaican, and that's why I love this place. So I think if you're purposely ripping off ideas, claiming them as your own, pretending to have a different persona, I think you're a piece of shit. But I think if you're genuine and you're exploring people, like I'm going to explore the witches, I'm going to explore the guys in Miami that are gangsters, I'm going to go to a Jewish holiday. Like I'm just trying to get a flavor of a life that's not mine and, and experience it for myself. I feel like you get a pass from a lot of people because you seem like you just have such a good heart overall. You know, and, and like you said, like ignore, like you ignoring the beef stuff. I think that probably goes a long way, you know? Also, I think I'm more than fair in the, like the fact that I'll send, I might do three or four revisions. Like, uh, the certified trapper video that we have out. If you see how many blurs are in that video, <laughs> that was a colossal investment of time. But because he's local Milwaukee, I would get it. And then I would drive to his house, show him it. <laughs> uh, 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 not this part, not this part. You know, maybe his boy would watch it that part go back home, we'd edit it. So I'm more than happy to make people comfortable with what's coming out. And so I feel like that's another way that makes me stay good anywhere I go. Mm, I like it. Who do you consider the goats on YouTube that you really look at and you're inspired by? I'm assuming Mr. Beast is probably near the front of the line in terms of just people who've taken this YouTube shit as far as it, it could be taken. I admire what he's doing, his style of content. I, I'm not, I don't watch a ton of YouTube. Like what I grew up on was the craziest vice documentaries. Like mm -hmm. we're going to go watch child labor in a Mexico mine and watch a six year old go to a mine. We're going to go to a Russian billionaire. That stuff to me was fascinating. But as far as currently on YouTube, who's really doing a remarkable job? Um, I am a big podcast guy. So like Theo Vaughn to me is one of the funniest, silliest yeah. guys. If I'm ever feeling down, I'll put on a Theo Vaughn podcast and I'm going to be laughing within the first few minutes. Right. Um, Joe Rogan is a guy that's like revolutionized the podcast space and just um, I really 
I've learned so much from like the Tim Ferrisses, the Joe Rogans, the Lex Friedmans. All these guys have just, it's been like, a co- this shit's on a college education. Mm. I just need to listen to a podcast. I need to go experience stuff hands-on. But I'm trying to think of like a YouTuber, YouTube guy. Um, I like, I'll mention from the jujitsu beef. And the, I like both of these guys. I like Brandon Buckingham. I like Danny Mullen. I think they're, they're both clever. They're witty. Um, they make me laugh. Um, I like... I like guys that aren't fitting into a box. Like you see so many street interviews that it's like you see 50 people ask the same question, like, does size matter? <laughs> or like stuff like that. And it's like anyone that is truly like practicing their craft, right. and you can tell like they really care about what they're putting out. Um, I'm cheering for. The man on the street stuff is so weird because that has just become such a gigantic genre online, on TikTok, on YouTube, whatever. And I actually did it for like basically the first time at the porn convention. Mm -hmm. And that was the weird thing is like you realize that if A, well, you can put a lot of effort and time into coming up with clever questions, Mm -hmm. but sometimes like the deep industry type questions or the questions that are more thoughtful seem like they perform worse when you're doing the man on the street stuff and yeah. then the stupid shit really does rise to the top the incentives are fucked on there there's a so i when i grew up uh i was listening to a lot of underground rap and there's a guy named immortal technique that i used to listen to a lot and he Legend. has a line that says when you go platinum it has nothing to do with luck it just means that a million people are stupid as fuck <laughs> and i really like that line because if you look at some of the stuff the most views, the most streams, the most this. It's not always the best singer, the best performer, the best this or the best that. It's the mainstream Kim Kardashian catchy shit that people consume. And there's, I guess there's nothing wrong with it. I don't want, I'm not going to be a snob and say I'm above that kind of taste. But I think the people that I admire innovate in some way. I don't care if you're a man on the street, but make it your own in some way. Mm. And that's how, and th- going back to maybe the, the cultural appropriation thing, like, what, what innovation and creation is, is taking one idea and then adding a new twist to it to, to take it to the next level. And that's how we advance. Like no one just starts out with, a, like it's really hard to start off with a completely new concept that no one's ever thought of or ever heard of in their life. But they say, oh, I saw this computer does this and I'm going to add this headphone jack. I'm gonna, you, you, you take ideas from different places and you make it better and that benefits society. Definitely. You were kind of asking me this question uh, when, when you were interviewing me earlier, but you know, you're head down, working your ass off to make mm. the best content you possibly can right now. Yeah. But how often do you zoom out and think, okay, what does this look like in five years? Or how, how does this maybe become a real company or a, a business that's bigger than it is in the future? Like, what are your long-term thoughts? Yeah. I don't know if I ever want to be the, like, I'm not going to try and expand to maximum growth. Like I never want to have a thousand employees. I want to have my hands on the business. So I want it to be something that I'm, I'm very invested in and I can, I'm very much part of the process. I want to like, let it go just to add another avenue. And so where I see it in five years, I'm sure I'm going to have a kid in the next year or so. I know that's going to change things in ways that I haven't thought of yet. Um, will I still go to the craziest places on earth when I have a, you know, a one-year-old baby? I don't know. I'm going to have to see how I feel in that moment. But where I see things going is this. I want to, I'm on the come up now. I want to cement myself as one of the undeniable documentary filmmakers on YouTube, one of the craziest documentarians there is. I want to do shows on streaming platforms. I want to grow my podcast, which Adam's one of the the first guests on the show. Right, because at first, earlier, I thought that you were just like interviewing me to include in the the video that we did like while we were working out and stuff mm. and then at a certain point i realized like oh this is a whole podcast okay yes. so that's a new thing that you got going and that's another stream because i think that's a, that has a lot of longevity and i can be a 50 year old man and do a podcast am i going to be 50 and go somewhere where i'm surrounded by 20 kids with guns probably not you mm. know um i think also i wanted to go a little bit more international with what i'm doing i want to do an england trip i want to do a brazil trip so i think uh that'll diversify the portfolio but Um, to me, where I want to be is I want to have enough investments at home between real estate and, uh, you know, like Vanguard portfolios that if YouTube decides to delete my channel, which I hope to God never happens, but we live in a world where it could, um, that I'm okay. And I never have to enter back into the cubicle office world. And so I think right now I'm just very much enjoying where I'm at. I'm very happy with my team. I'm very happy with my family. I'm very happy on the direction we're going. It's all exciting. And I'm very grateful because i've been on the other end where it's like i have no idea how i'm going to piece this together 
and where I'm going to go. So to me, it's like, enjoy this. Let's, let's keep the foot on the pedal. And two, three years from now, let's, you know, we're going to add different pieces to it, but let's maybe, it'll, maybe it'll only go to two or three videos a month instead of one every single week. Mm. Who knows how long I can keep a pace like this up, but for a little bit more, I can. Yeah. When you're really in that growth phase, it's like, and especially when you're young, you just got your fucking foot on the pedal and you're just going. And then I'll be real with you. Like when I had a kid was when I started to realize the value of slowing down and how much I needed to slow down. So I would be very interested to have this conversation with you in like a year, two years, because man, leaving for a week now is fucking tough when I'm leaving that kid behind. It's like brutal emotionally. Like yeah. literally I'm like in like a, a weird semi depression for like 24 hours after I leave her. And then it starts to mellow out and I'm like, okay, she's, she's fine. You're being selfish by wanting to be around her this much. You got to just relax and do your job. You know, I already feel this to an extent already. Cause I love, I love being at home. I love my wife. I love my dog, Frank. And so leaving is like, Oh man, like I want to hug Frank. I want to hug my wife. But I do know that this is what's going to be able to set my family up is to keep doing stuff like this. And in a period like the, the, the come up period only comes like if you're lucky once a life, maybe. Right. So it's like, I'm not just going to sit at home and I, my kid needs me to do this. Right. Like, unless they want me to be miserable back at a job I hate. Because all you have to do is rewind like a year, a year and a half, whenever, to the point where you probably would have killed or not killed, but you would have. Uh, yes. You would have gone to the end of the earth to be doing the kind of views that yes. you're doing now, to be on, even being on here, I'm assuming is probably like pretty fucking cool for you to be able to tell your story on a big platform and stuff. Like, these are yes, things that course. I know where your brain was at a year, year and a half ago. And it's like, Man, that feels good when you've kind of just gotten to the point where people are actually listening to you and you actually feel like you have an audience for your ideas. I bet if you did the marathon video now, it would do much better. Yeah, this this all feels <laughs> probably and this all feels wonderful. Like I'm I feel like there's times where I get I get tears because it's like I can't believe I'm in the position that I am doing the things I'm doing. Like I actually am doing the things that I love and I'm passionate about as my job. And that's self-actualization. And that's something that Few of us are lucky enough to achieve because a lot, I mean, there is luck involved in this too. Like, I think that I'm working hard. I think I'm putting out good stuff, but there's also, you know, a weird way that luck works. No, that's a fact. Um, okay. So you want to thank anybody? You want to uh, tell the people to check out anything in particular? If you want to see the craziest documentaries on YouTube, go to Tommy G, type in the Kia Boys, Most Dangerous City in America. I have, I have dozens of videos that I think you might enjoy. Uh, Thank you to my wife. Thank you to my dog, Frank, my team out there, Miguel and Keegan, uh, Kristen and Jack back home. It's one hell of a journey. I'm happy to be on it. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, man. It was great meeting you. Great to catch a workout this morning. Gang, gang, baby. Yeah, and I feel like uh, you got big things to come. I feel like this interview, we're going to be seeing people coming back to this for years like, oh, look at this. Look at this guy in the very early stages of his career. It was pretty sick. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, Tommy. Tommy G. Peace. No jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, OnlyFans, Instagram, etc. Like, comment, and subscribe. Nojumper.com. If you want to support, go subscribe to my man after you do all those things. And if you have a crazy idea, email me at TommyGMcGee123 or at, on Instagram, TommyGMcGee. If you're in Antifa, you're in the KKK, <laughs> I don't care where, like, uh, you make moonshine in the woods. Hit me up. I'll come to your I'd city. like to see you do some graffiti stuff. I'd like to throw that idea out there. I would love I would love to do that. Maybe some hardcore shows, too, because that, that stuff's real viral right now. These dudes beating each other up in the mosh pit. I'd like to see you in that world. Let's rock and roll, baby. <laughs> Let's go. Tommy. Bow.